Well, good morning and welcome to our next panel discussion, Protecting Pigs, People and Places, Key Principles of Biosecurity. This session of the Global Hog Industry Virtual Conference is sponsored by Neogen. I'm Andy Vance, host of the Feedstuffs in Focus podcast, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. In this session, I'm joined by four experts in the area of veterinary medicine and biosecurity who will help us work through some of the most important aspects of protecting the pigs and the people in your operation. We'll talk with Dr. Andrea Pitkin, a health assurance veterinarian who oversees the health of PIC's U.S. multiplication herds. Dr. Tom Gillespie, a veterinary consultant with Performance Health PC and one of National Hog Farmers 2018 Masters of the Pork Industry. Dr. Nick Wagner, a professional services veterinarian with the Animal Safe Divi Safety Division at Neogen. And Mr. Stuart Heller, a technical services manager with Neogen has more than 35 years of experience in swine industry biosecurity under his belt, so a pretty distinguished panel all the way around. Their biographies, if you want to learn more about them, are in your viewing console, so you can read those at any time. And there are plenty of helpful resources from our sponsor, Neogen, on the topic of biosecurity and disinfectant. So take advantage of those in your viewing console as well. You can submit questions to our panelists at any time during the discussion using the Q&A widget in your viewing console. Just type those in and we'll cover as many questions as we can at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, and if you have any technical difficulties or issues, also just type those into that Q&A window and we'll get some one-on-one -on -one assistance for you as well. All right, without further ado, let's get involved in the conversation. So this is a pretty big topic for a lot of reasons, but, but let's start with the question of, when the industry talks about biosecurity, explain the ultimate goal of implementation and the key principles of a comprehensive biosecurity protocol. Andrea, you work with some pretty big herds. Let's let's start with you. What is the ultimate goal we're talking about when we talk about a comprehensive biosecurity program? Yeah, um, for me, comprehensive biosecurity all pertains around feasibility of implementation and putting in the steps that make the most sense for that process or protocol to be successful. So really it comes down to facilities, training, and then understanding the science and understanding how you can apply that to your operation. Tom, you've been doing this out in practice a long time. How, how does that line up with your approach to biosecurity with the, the herds you consult with? Well, it fits right in. And each herd has unique features that have to be incorporated. <clears throat> you might it, That might be part of the training. For instance, is there a perimeter fence? And, you know, so that's the first uh, clean, dirty line that you try to educate these the producers with. And then, then you move that clean, dirty line right into the interior of the, uh, of the unit itself. And sure, there's all kinds of steps in there, but it's that dilution effect of biosecurity. We're not going to sterilize a unit um, because we've got animals and they're going to be excreting and shedding things. So it's all about dilution in trying to keep pathogens out. We can deal with the pathogens that are there. So we just need to keep the pathogens out the best we can. And Nick, we have uh, a, a lot of tools in our toolbox to do that. So when we dig into some of the, the specifics of how we develop a program, things like bioexclusion, biomanagement, biocontainment, what are some of the things that you're most focused on to help a producer get the job done in creating these comprehensive biosecurity systems. Yeah, I think uh, as Andrea and Tom both talked about, you know, you, you've got to have a multi-layered approach uh, when you look at it. And as you, as you mentioned there, Andy, uh, you've got three main areas when, when you talk biosecurity from the aspect of trying to keep those pathogens off the farm uh, from the bioexclusion standpoint, uh, biocontainment, basically trying to prevent those should you have disease on the farm being transmitted to any other operations or other facilities within your own uh, company or the, the biomanagement itself actually dealing with um, disease on the farm. So Andrea, what's that look like for you when you're going through the facilities, the, the different multipliers that you work on, uh, the, the specifics that you think about from bioexclusion, biomanagement and, and biocontainment? 
So we certainly try to make every effort to have dedicated equipment, dedicated pieces, things that are staying within that farm or at least within a multiplication system to prevent any outside sources. So anytime that you can segregate, dedicate or designate anything that needs to come in contact with the farm or, you know, external processes, uh, that's typically where we try to aim for. That can be very expensive. That can be not feasible. So if it, if it can't be a dedicated process, then we look to decontamination and how can we reduce the risks of decontamination? What are key areas that we can implement uh, clean, dirty lines? And then how do we manage those clean, dirty lines? We try to talk to our employees that you, you have a clean, dirty line on the farm. Nothing can cross that without some type of decontamination or cleaning step. And what are those key areas on the farm? So we talk a lot about how are people getting in? How are pigs getting out? How are pigs getting in for that matter? And then supplies or any other equipment. And again, um, do we need it in the farm? Does it have to leave the farm? And if it does or doesn't, how do we properly manage that person, that item, that pig? Tom, I, I could tell there was something Andrea said there tripped tripped something for you. So so chime in here. Give us give, give us more feedback on this. Well, I'd love to. Uh, basically, I like to start with what Nick was going on with the bio exclusion, bio management, and bio containment. Those are the three legs to the stool, and so that gives the employees uh, a mental picture, and then you move your conversation into the fact that just like Andrea was saying, there's these clean, dirty lines and we need to process things through them, but everybody has to practice the same level of biosecurity on a daily basis or there's gonna be mistakes made. Stu, I wanna get into some of the things in the toolbox. I I kind of used that analogy earlier. Disinfectants, one of those pretty valuable tools in the toolbox of a biosecurity program. So what are some of the features you think folks need to look for when they're selecting the proper chemistry for a disinfectant? You, you've been in that business for quite some time. Um, educate us a little bit. Well, I want to touch base on a couple of things. Uh, Doc mentioned something very important. It is one of his very first statements is that if we had a, if I had to give a definition for what biosecurity really is, um, I think we look at it as procedures that we we execute to keep new diseases from entering and infecting a farm. As uh, Dr. Gillespie mentioned, farms have disease on them. So our job is to is to try and prevent the introduction of new disease. Um, when we're talking about biosecurity procedures being implemented, there's been a lot of talk recently about um, developing a culture of biosecurity. You know, we don't want to just tell employees uh, what they need to do. We want to tell them why they're doing it and what the potential consequences of not following those procedures could be. Um, I look at the changes, and having done this for so long, um, I look at the changes that we've implemented. You know, you talk about the toolbox. Um, there are dis- you know, there, there's a wide array of disinfectants on the market, various chemistries. Um, they all have their pros and cons. When we're doing a checklist for what people need to look for in disinfectants, we obviously want a product that has a broad spectrum activity versus industry specific disease. So I, if I'm a pork producer and I'm choosing a disinfectant, I want something effective against swine-specific disease. Um, I want a product that's user-friendly. You know, you can make products as harsh as you want, and they'll kill things. But I've always been of, of the belief that uh, convenience equals compliance. And if I make things easy for employees, then the chances of them getting it done are a lot greater. You know, where sometimes we get this impression that we can just hang a black box on the wall and that solves all of our problems. And there's no single product, there's no single program that does that. Um, What we need is 50% from employees and 50% from us. 
So if we make it easier for folks to use products, chances are they do a little better job. I always use the, uh, the example that if I send a wash crew into a building with a product that's just very abrasive, harsh to be around, irritative, makes them, uh, makes them cough, makes their eyes burn, then human nature tells us those folks are in and out of that building as fast as they could go. Um, on the other hand, if I make a product that has a nice aroma to it, that's easy on their skin, that they don't find so offensive, maybe we get fortunate and they, uh, they stay in that facility and, and do a better job and help the product do what it's supposed to do. That's, does that line up with what you see when you're out working with systems and, and dealing with folks in the barns? It's changed quite a bit through the years. You know, it's, uh, I've had a couple of different products in the marketplace through the years. And uh, in the early years, uh, and Doc will remember this as well as anybody, um, the theory was any product that smells that bad and burns that bad must be working. Um <laughs> Uh, as the movement has gone towards safer alternatives, uh, alternatives that, that Neogen has that other companies might have, other types of chemistries that are much more user-friendly, uh, the people are finding out that the medicine just doesn't have to taste bad to work good. And there's there's plenty of high-performance products that aren't chasing guys out of it. Nick, what, what do you what do you see there? Uh, Stu gave some pretty good insights. You know, when you're consulting uh, with clients, are those things that are are important to them as well? Barn managers and, and particularly employees are those um, discussions that you have out in the field? Absolutely. Yeah, Stu brings up a lot of good points. You know, being the first that. Uh, you want that product definitely to be broad spectrum. So obviously you're controlling the pathogens you have concern with and that are going to be of the uh, the biggest uh, detriment to the, the herd that you're managing. I think a couple other areas, in, and Stu kind of alluded to this one, uh, safety, uh, but just, you know, looking at that safety from the standpoint, not only of the personnel, but as from the environment, if you have anything with a chemistry that potentially can be uh, something that, uh, as you, as it basically uh, diminishes or potentially would build up in the environment, you, you know, you're basically wanting something that doesn't have those uh, toxicity concerns. So, so safety is a big thing for for all of our producers because I think all of our producers want to be good stewards of the environment and are, and so that's a that's a very important aspect that they look at as well. And then I think it's not tops on the list, uh, but I think we all know that our producers are trying to. Uh, minimize cost. So I think that is one of the things that they will also look at after they look at multiple other factors, as we've talked about being more important, but that is something that that's part of the decision. I think that goes into it for them. Well, let's expand on that a little bit. You, you mentioned cost. Certainly we're in an environment where I think we're all worried about our, our margins and making sure that we're making good choices. And so that means getting all the value out of the products we pay for. Right. So let's talk about application uh, Stu, you alluded to it that if uh, we're in and out as fast as we can, we're maybe not getting all our money's worth out of that product. So what are some of the, the keys uh, to proper application of a disinfectant? And then I'd like to hear from Tom and Andrea as well. What are things you see that we do well and what are things you see we don't do well when you talk about an average barn and, and walking through a visit? Well, I, I always thought that the uh, the key to uh, proper disinfectant application with the type of equipment. And the equipment has changed and, and improved vastly through the years. Um, simple things, right? If I'm applying product through a, uh, through a high pressure washer and that high pressure washer is cranking out 2000 PSI, um, am I really making contact with that surface or do I just have disinfectant bouncing off the wall and ending up on the floor. So years ago, uh, we looked at uh, some of the application methods that were going on in food processing plants, and they were using foaming applications. They were turning their disinfectants into a, a thick, rich foam that provided a number of advantages. Um, it was very visible, so people could see areas that they've made contact with 
because it was a phone, we increased contact time. And I don't want, it doesn't matter who's disinfecting or who's cleaner you're using, they all rely on the ability to remain in contact with that surface. Um, there are benefits to employees. When we foam, we, we eliminate the aerosol mist that comes from high pressure spray. Uh, so if I had to, to pick, you know, the two or three main uh, attributes of, of an application system, I would make sure that, uh, number one, I could properly dilute the product. You know, there are products that are recommended to be diluted at a half ounce per gallon or a gallon, ounce per gallon. And heck, I could go to trade shows. I've been going for 20 something years and I could ask any producer who walked up and down the aisle, how are you? They have that downstream injector valve and they open or close it depending, you know, on what type of container they have. And well, how are you setting it? How do you know that you're getting the proper dilution? And to a man, it's always, well, I just open that valve until it smells real good, smells real strong. And, you know, it might be good for the manufacturer at some point, but it's not very good for the producer. Um, so accurate dilution rates, uh, I'm sure one of the things we'll get into at some point is proper protective equipment. That's become a big player, but um, disinfectants were manufactured to perform at certain rates. And uh, as opposed to the human theory, if this much works, twice as much works, twice as good, really doesn't apply here. Tom, Tom Andrea, what, what do you see when you're out working with um, folks in barns, what do we tend to do well? What do we tend to miss the ball on when it comes to uh, application and getting the job done? Andrea, you want to start? Sure. Um, kind of building off of what Stu said, uh, you need a clean surface for disinfectant to work. And I think a big piece that a lot of us are missing is using detergents. Uh, you're not giving that disinfectant its best ability to have contact or disinfect that surface if it's got organic material on it. We particularly focus on this a lot in trucks, uh, you know, fairing rooms, things that we're cleaning consistently. So um, one thing I don't think we do well and have a big opportunity to improve upon is using detergents, using soakers, making sure we're getting that disinfectants contact because as Stu said, that's extremely important and the ability to work at uh, its proper rate and dilution to, to neutralize any pathogens that we, we have on those. Tom, what do you think? Well, I'd like to, Andy, if you'd allow me to kind of break this down into three areas. Okay. Know your target. So some of my consulting takes me outside of the United States, and ASF virus is, is their enemy. So that's, that's their focus right now. That's, that's the entire focus. So choose the right tool that will help you in other pathogens as well. So knowing your enemy, knowing your target, and then knowing your weapons. What weapons are you going to apply? Andrea did a great job. We need some detergent on there first proper application of the uh, detergent, the power washing, and then the disinfectant. And then the last is monitor the application. And that goes into things like the dilution rate, checking the, checking the equipment. I think that's part of the practitioner's opportunity on these farms in training and educating the biosecurity leads to say, hey, you know, let's check this equipment. Is it right? Is that tip? Is it a plastic tip? Has it worn? Are we using too much or not enough? And then the foaming, I wanted to bring that up as well. That was a huge step in our cleaning process in our application of disinfectants. I want to stick with you for a minute, Tom, when, because I think you set this up pretty well when you talked about knowing the enemy, knowing your target. How do we define or, or would you define for us a biosecurity risk event and maybe identify some of the most common ones that you see impacting swine operations in the U.S.? Oh, we still have risk events that occur. Um, and one of the tools, well, I'll get into the risk events first. Let's just take uh, the truck and trailer. Is the cab clean? 
I just got a text from a manager and he showed me the, the inside of the cab that delivers their winged pigs. And he knew because he's protecting the south farm. He knew that the cab wasn't up to standards. So that's the training that comes through in trying to monitor everybody. Uh, so trucks and trailers are still very important to us. Look what it does with uh, bringing a pathogen back from a concentration point back to a unit. Now, sometimes we take those risks, Andy. You know, if we're going to empty that that finishing site within the next three weeks, producers will take that risk and they'll do two loads a day without cleaning in between, things like that. And so we are in a risk management uh, profession, and we have to accept that, but then also monitor. One of the tools Stu educated me on many, many years ago was let's go in and check the environment. So at first we started using just blood auger plates, and then we got the 3M came out, the Dow Ag came out with different tools for us to be able to check that environment. And that was a tremendous visual. We could show the producer, yeah, you did everything proper, but we still have bacteria that can grow. So, again, it's all about training, educating, and, uh, and then monitoring. Nick, some good examples there. What are other examples you think uh, we ought to be thinking about of a, a biosecurity risk event? Yeah, there's there's quite a few, as Tom mentioned, some there. But another one I think that we, we have to look at is just employee movement on and off these operations. Because uh, Tom kind of alluded to the fact of what we're doing with biosecurity is we're essentially looking at the risk. So I think when you look at uh, risk events, you look at, what is the level of risk for the event and what's the frequency that that event occurs? And so one that occurs quite often, as I mentioned, is that employee movement on and off the farm. So looking at being able to ensure that if you've got a shower in, shower out, like most facilities do, that that, that procedure is being implemented appropriately. Um, so so that's, you know, the areas that that you want to that you want to look at. Other things would be uh, deliveries, you know potentially feed deliveries, uh, supply deliveries. Those are risk events as well. You know, a lot of these farms or most farms have their uh, decontamination or disinfecting rooms. So those, that's an important uh, risk event that has to be managed. Uh, another thing is the, the movement of potentially manure off the operation or uh, something like uh, dealing with the, uh, the rendering or how they're handling their uh, mortalities. Uh, is, a, is another thing that has to be looked at. So I think there's a long list of, of risk events, but I think it boils down to uh, getting back to, you know, what is the level of risk with each one of those and what's the frequency of those events and then basically mitigating it based on that. So Andrew, let's pick up from there. When you're looking at your multiplier herds, what are some of the biosecurity procedures you're implementing to mitigate some of those specific risk events that, uh, uh, Nick and Tom just highlighted. Really, when it comes down to it, and it was touched on earlier, um, it, it's a culture. It's getting people to understand the importance of biosecurity and then taking accountability for that. And it's imperative that it isn't just, hey, I need you to do this process this way. There absolutely has to be a why. And this is what happens if you don't do it correctly. And I even push with training that you need to train people out of a biosecurity situation. So much we focus on don't cross the red line. Well, what happens when I do cross the red line? And how do I, how do I work my way out of a known biosecurity break? Because what we don't want people to do is panic. We want them to be educated and we want them to understand, oh, you know, I crossed I can't go back this way. This is what I need to do to contain. There's so much technology now, such as this meeting where you can call people, you can, you know, video certain things like, how do I do this? How do I set this up properly? So I think where we're lacking is not in the science. We're lacking in training and implementing and educating and making sure people understand. 
So, you know, specifically, we focus on that education pieces. And certainly, you know, you can get into the details of, yes, mortalities is a significant factor. Trucking is a significant factor. People coming in and off the farm. But I think too many times we forget it's a person driving that truck. It's a person taking that mortality out. So really, we need to not be focused on it was a trucking event. We need to be focused on the people handling that trucking event and really work with them and focus on the why and the how. Tom, how hard is that, that, that people side of that versus the, the technology, the science side? I, I could tell Andrew was singing from your hymnal up there. I was, oh, I was about to get an amen, I, I thought. So uh, how, how do we work I, through that, that people problem? Andy, I was very close to saying all men to her statements. <laughs> and, and, and what happens in practice is evidence-based medicine. And so a lot of times evidence-based medicine, we, we're learning as we're going. And for, here's a great example that comes off of Andrea's points. We now have a study that shows us if we put the bench entry system in front of the shower, we have less of the breaks, less of the contamination that gets through. So that's a that's a beautiful picture of what Andrea was talking about and how we we learn as we go with evidence based medicine. It's it's tremendous. It's practice. Stuart, I wanna you wanna go back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago. You you alluded to PPE being a pretty valuable tool in our biosecurity program. So let, let let's take off on that as we're talking about people. Um, So discuss the proper usage of PPE, if you will, and uh, and I think a lot of us are probably reading more and more about PPE in our our current uh, walk of life, so let's drill it into the the swine space. Sure. Well, let me, I want to touch on two points real quick so I don't forget them. Um, The problem, the quote-unquote problem, the difficulty in biosecurity and implementing it properly is that it's it's a program that can't be piecemeal. You know, you can't decide I'll do this, I'll do that, but I'm going to skip this one because I don't have time for it. I mean, I think especially the PED outbreak more than anything else, when it illustrated to us that large amounts of virus could be shed in very small amounts of manure, uh, points directly to what Andrea was talking about, about the importance of the detergency. Um, as far as PPE goes, that's a it's a little different type of topic because it's uh, federally regulated. I mean, anyone who reads a disinfectant label, no matter how safe that manufacturer tells you his disinfectant is, when the producer reads that label and sees danger, warning, caution can be fatal. If I mean, so all the safety talk goes out the window. So uh, we urgently stress the producers the need to, at the very minimum, you know, wear some waterproof gloves and footwear, put on rain slickers and smocks, wear a mask, uh, you know, or a face shield just to stop splashing from coming in. You know, we found the biggest problem with, with these type of applications is the truck wash because it's you're in very tight, close quarters you're spraying disinfectant and or even during your washdown procedure you've got you know 1500 2000 psi you got stuff splashing all over the place you've got to be protected um we used to have there were a couple of times and we would call the epa through the years and go look if you're making it impossible for people to sell these products because they're getting scared as soon as they read the label and for the first time, the EPA told us that, well, you know, we're doing this for your protection because that comp, that product in that jug that you're labeling is in concentrated. Now, you can dilute it down all you want, but people are still handling that. So I think PPE also falls into that convenience compliance uh, model that I've been talking about for years is that um, we have to make sure that workers are protected that they are not, uh, that they don't find the product too difficult to be around. Um, so um, there are further, you can take PPEs as, as far down the line as you, as you need to, uh, to ensure protection. Um, I think it's up to manufacturers as well 
to make sure that uh, their products themselves have been tested adequately from a safety standpoint to make sure that, look, let, let's face the reality, right? Summertime comes, it's getting really hot out there. You know, you're telling your guys to wear gloves and masks and everything else. And they're going, my gosh, it's just too hot. I'm sweating. I just can't. Right. So uh, that, that's that's the burden that we bear. And it's just incumbent upon us to keep on banging home that point that, look, this is for your own protection. Uh, these are you know, disinfectants are classified as pesticides. Right. So we have to make sure that proper precautions are taken along those lines. So what are you know, maybe you highlighted a couple of those. What are the most common failures you observe when it comes to PPE? I think it's just that. I think it's a it's a it's a human nature weather, you know, seasonal type thing. Uh, people are thinking about their own comfort or discomfort. And uh, we find folks who are uh, exposing themselves to chemistries, uh, sometimes using them far stronger than they need to. I, I think uh, I think Nick and I have been involved and some other folks at Neogen have been involved with, you know, people calling and saying, well, the product seems to be kind of rough and our people are having a tough time with it. And our best response to that is to get out there, you know, go visit the site. And I am, I am being as honest as I can be when I tell you that in 100% of the time, uh, folks are using far more product than they're supposed to, to the point where we can illustrate to them in their facilities that, you know, the dilution rate is recommended at a half ounce per gallon. You guys are using six per gallon, right? So at a half ounce per gallon, I'm confident in telling you how safe the product is to be around at six ounces per gallon. All bets are off. And so I think it's, I think a lot of it's a human nature. You know, I think people, we all know the right thing to do. Uh, whether we do it or not, is, you know, up for, up for grabs. Nick, that, that's got me thinking about human nature. So let, let's talk about um, a couple outbreaks of interest. So African swine fever, we've made it halfway through this talk without even mentioning COVID-19, which is maybe the longest any of us have gone for weeks without actually thinking about or mentioning um, COVID-19. So let's bring that into the discussion as well. So with those outbreaks, behavior obviously is a pretty important piece of the puzzle. So talk us through behavior as it relates to those specific outbreaks and, and the swine industry. Yeah, uh, you know, both of those that you mentioned, the African swine fever uh, outbreak that we've seen in, in uh, Asia and in Europe, um, and then with the, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak that we're dealing with on the human side right now, uh, people movement has been important in both of those situations uh, because you see places over there in, in Asia where the African swine fever has, has jumped across bodies of water. Um, and the same things happen with uh, essentially the COVID-19, you know, a, a virus that gets its start uh, in Asia. And, and now we're, we're dealing with it widespread here in the U S so uh, the, these, these type pathogens know, no boundaries, but it goes back to the fact that uh, the movement of people is so important in how those pathogens travel, whether it's on clothing, whether it's in products that those individuals are moving around. Uh, but we truly live in a global world anymore, and, and we've got to be cognizant of that. Um, and, and those are the things where behavior is so important, and it's back to the, the comments that, that Andrea has made about getting people to really understand why we talk biosecurity and why it's so important and, and the ways to mitigate uh, these things and essentially the ways to control movements of people when we are dealing with these type outbreaks so that we can truly contain them uh, is extremely important. So Andy, let me, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, please, by all means do. The, this people movement is, is right to the heart of, I think, where the, the breakdown is today. It's funny you mentioned the same thing that we, hadn't touched on COVID yet until right now, yet it's impacting all of us, you know, tremendously. And, uh, and I see some, and I'm sure others see it as well, some pretty eerie similarities 
uh, between this COVID-19 break and something like PED, right? They were, they're both coronaviruses, okay? They're both new novel viruses, which means we had no uh, natural immunity in the herds or the population. We have no vaccines for it. Um, but the things that we were able to do, and I give full 100% credit to the veterinary this, because like they always do, they took the lead on this and they told everybody, look, no matter what you think you were doing for biosecurity and how comprehensive you thought your programs were, you weren't even close. And we had, we need to implement all these additional layers to physically keep this virus out. And one of those things, obviously, that we are able to do in pork production is control animal movement, right? We, we, we know where we want these animals to go. Do we want them quarantined? Do we want them offsite? Whatever it might be. We can't do that with people, right? But now we're trying, you know, we're telling people, stay home, stay inside, don't go in crowds. And then you turn on the six o'clock news and there's a bunch of teenage knuckleheads on the beach, you know, all over each other, coming back home afterwards and bringing virus with them. And, and I think that's the difference. You know, if we could control people movement, you know, if we could get the population to buy in as easy as we were able to get, you know, the pigs to buy in, um, we'd probably have our, our arms around this a heck of a lot better than we do right now. So, Stu, what changes human behavior? I, I hey, think hey. I think the consequences of what we're seeing well, yeah, right now. Let, let's put it into one word. Let's just call it pain. It can be <laughs> economic pain if it's an owner or whatever. But that that's what is happening today. That's what happened with PED breaks. The pain that was there. The people didn't want to see the pigs dying. The people taking care of the pigs really care about their animals. And so they didn't want that. So evidence-based medicine, we found out it was a coronavirus. Hey, this is like TGE. So we applied the techniques even before the closure of the population. All of that came about. Now our human colleagues, they think in a much different way than we do as veterinarians. They're not used to thinking of a population. They're thinking of a case report. You know, this person or this six people or whatever we're, we're very, very fortunate to have non-invasive tests that we can test the population today. We know if it's there, if it's not there, if it's shedding or not shedding. You know, so we've got some tools because we're thinking in that manner and people have developed these tools for us. It's just, it's, it's amazing. It, but truly, you're right. It's pain that changes human behavior. Andrea, that's that's a good segue. You know, I'm thinking about the global pork industry. You know, the pork industry is a pretty vital cog of the overall global food infrastructure, and, and we're in a global marketplace, and and so on. So, with the context of what what Tom just got me thinking about, what what advice would you give for your colleagues, uh, the veterinary space, swine producers, pork processors, as we deal with some of these challenges from COVID nineteen? You know, Tom said it great. It, it takes pain, and, and how I've put it is it seems like people don't react or don't change until they've been burned. So the example that I use is, you know, don't let a, a risk event happen to you before you believe, before you adapt biosecurity. And it's it's very interesting in the unfortunate circumstances where we've I've worked with producers in, you know, practice and even to a point now where biosecurity isn't that much of a priority until they have a break. And then, you know, it's all bets are on and it, it, it's unfortunate that we have to have those events occur before people realize it. And I think it goes back to kind of what Tom was saying earlier is, there's a cost to biosecurity. You have risk and we're willing to accept risk. Well, we have to know what risks we can and cannot accept. And that's really difficult with biosecurity because I can't tell you, I know you prevented this break because 
you put in a fumigation room, or I know you prevented this break because you put in a shower. I'm saying that I know that diseases can transmit through this route and you should protect yourself. And so that becomes you know, really difficult because if I could have a magic way, if you will, to say, hey, you had virus on your doorstep and because you had that shower, because you had that boot branch, it didn't come in, that's a much easier lesson to teach people. So, you know, I, I think it's hard for us to always know what to say or, or what to talk about or what to convince because you get people that don't understand that it's a little bit of an arbitrary um, risk event because they don't know how, when, or why it's it's coming. Um, I think about that a lot in the face of COVID-19. You know, everyone's hearing, wash your hands, don't go out, don't go this. And again, I put that back to, well, probably not going to happen to me. And I think people look at biosecurity the same way. So I'm going to open this question up for everybody. What do, what do we think is the food systems, the food supplies, um, overall role in the risk of transmission of COVID-19 with everything we've just been talking about, about people behavior and, and the things we're supposed to be doing, what risk do we think the food supply chain poses in terms of transmission? And I'll open that up for everybody on the panel. I'll go ahead and lead off. And I think it's important to, uh, for folks to realize that, um, you know, FDA inspected facilities, USDA inspected facilities on the meat and poultry side, uh, they've got sanitation practices in place already based on regulatory requirements as to how those plants are to operate. And uh, despite this uh, virus being a challenge, uh, those sanitation practices, those cleaners and sanitizers and things that are used in those facilities are going to control it. Uh, the biggest part is um, realizing that uh, even though there have been some indications out here that maybe there is an enteric part to this, it's mainly a respiratory virus. Uh, so there is no indication at this point that this uh, virus is going to spread through food or food packaging. Uh, but it's still important uh, that these processors and uh, any folks that are part of that critical infrastructure realize the importance of protecting their people uh, is, is extremely important because you've got to maintain that labor force that's going to be necessary to keep these animals healthy, keep these animals fed on the farms be able to keep these animals moved to market, be able to allow the processing floor to operate, to harvest these animals. So I think that's extremely important. And then I think you got to look at the supply side of it, uh, making sure that folks look at uh, making sure that they plan for potential disruptions in, in uh, the supply chain so they're prepared. Uh, and then that's going to allow uh, folks to, to be able to continue to get the food that we all need uh, to, to nourish our bodies, but in the same token, realize that uh, you still just got to put those personal hygiene and those sanitation practices in place, but the food itself, I don't see being being a, uh, a, a big concern as far as uh, spreading, you know, the virus. Tom, you mentioned earlier the things we learned from PEDV, and, and Stu, you talked about this some as well, the, the lessons we learned as uh, you used the phrase evidence-based medicine. So what do, you, what do you see as some of the specific strategies or lessons that we learned during that PEDV outbreak that has some applicability to our current challenges with, with COVID-19? I want to mention a couple of things here, Andy. One is the fact that uh, we started looking at transmission in, in a more broad way and figured out pretty quickly from evidence-based medicine. This, this stuff seems to be coming in with, with some kind of feed product because it's breaking when we start to feed creek feed in the ferryman. So it was really fascinating to see how our public health organizations around the world started first looking at transmission. But what have we heard in the last few days? You know, we have contam or decontamination rooms, fumigation rooms on these farms. But well, now we're hearing, hey, even if you bring those food items home from the grocery store, think about the packaging that you're carrying them with. You know, we don't have a fumigation room to put them in necessarily, but we can dispose of some of that or we can wipe it down. 
So there's a lot of similarities when it comes to biosecurity between the animal kingdom and the human side of things. Andrea, any any thoughts there uh, that you want to add, things that we've learned from recent swine industry outbreaks that uh, are good lessons for us to take forward as we as we wrap up our panel together? One of the things that we've thought a lot about or implemented in, um, is just being more aware of disinfection. The uh, number of virus particles, you know, disease transmission at its basis is you have to have a disease that is infectious in a high enough quantity that then has a route to get to a person or animal, get in the person or animal, and then be able to replicate and cause disease. So when you're talking about you know, dilution is the solution to pollution earlier, what Dr. Tom said is absolutely correct. Wiping things down, having less contact. Um, we've been encouraging a lot of the farms, think about the places that you're touching a lot, the phones, the feed control panels, the ventilation uh, system, disinfecting the showers more. Um, when you go into the break room, probably instead of cleaning the break room weekly, it needs to be more like daily. We've even asked people to stagger shifts. So everybody's getting in their same number of hours, but um, people are working at different times or taking their lunch breaks at different times. So any way that you can reduce the amount of virus in the environment, let alone reduce the ability then for it to contact whatever host it's wanting to get into, I think is directly applicable to how um, we are trying to handle COVID-19 and, and is very applicable to what we do on farms. Let's finish with this before we open up the, the lines for audience questions. And, and members of the audience, reminder, if you've got questions for any of our panelists, you can submit those in that Q&A widget on your screen. But I'll ask one one final one before we go to audience Q&A. So, Nick, and let's start with you and then and, uh, and Stuart, we'll kind of go around the horn here. What should we be doing in this industry to be prepared to deal with emerging pathogens, the, the next one that uh, we won't know is on us until it's on us? What what are things we ought to be doing now to be prepared? Yeah, I think one of the one of the big things we, that we need to keep doing, and I think the swine industry does a great job of this, is keep the, the collaboration uh, happening that occurs between producers and veterinarians and uh, university leaders and, and any of the key uh, opinion leaders within the industry, uh, keep that collaboration open. I think another thing is continue to uh, fund research that's all important to understand uh, what emerging pathogens we may be dealing with. Um, and, and then I think another thing that we've got to look at doing is always looking to maintain the capabilities to develop rapid diagnostic testing capabilities for um, for dealing with stuff like this, because we realize that's one of the challenges that we're seeing with the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And then I think one of the final points that I'll make in that regard um, is, is basically ensuring that um, we, when we look at a disease outbreak on a farm, that we're remaining vigilant in how we go about investigating and not just because it may look like something that we've seen before to not overlook looking a bit deeper to ensure that it isn't something uh, that's novel and that, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning where you can contain it a lot easier uh, if you identify it quicker. Stu, Andrea. So Tom. I would, I would, agree, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that the, uh, you know, I've said it, I've probably said it a few times than I needed to, but uh, we're dealing with people. You know, it's a human nature business. Um, I think the tendency to relax after all the bad times are in the rearview mirror is always there. I think it's been going on since the beginning of time, you know, back to Old and New Testament, right? It's like when things are good, everybody's happy. When things are bad, we're, we're crying out for help. So I, I think that um, as we buckle down and we, uh, we add our layers of biosecurity and we educate our employees as to not only what we want them to do, but why we want them to do it. We develop this culture 
of biosecurity, the, the key, and Nick used the word vigilant, uh, we have to remain vigilant. You know, it can't be, well, we haven't had the problem in a year or so, so it's probably not coming back. Because if you wait until it's on your doorstep, you're, you're waiting too late. You know, you've already incurred your losses and you're trying to stop the bleeding. Uh, so I think uh, I think this is where the veterinary community is, is always in the lead on this and they're always encouraging, you know, prevention rather than treatment. You know, it's something it's a it's a, something that we we've, we've discussed forever. Um, and uh, as Andrea mentioned, pain is a great motivator. So hopefully we we continue to learn from the past. So I think it goes back to the, you know, the culture and the training that we've already talked about. And one, you know, example that I give a lot of times is if you think about farming and you think about the technologies. So let's say, for example, there's a lot of barns out there built in the 1990s. So I'll talk with those producers and ask how many of you still have your computer? that you had in 1990. You've probably upgraded since then. And, or, you know, your car. You might still be driving a car from 1992, but I bet you've put tires on it. Or you've probably put in a different stereo system so you can plug your, your Android or your uh, iPhone into the speaker system. The point is, is that we don't think of biosecurity in that same technological advancements. A lot of barns are paid for, and so we're we're utilizing our, our revenues off of that, and we don't realize that um, not having a proper chute, not having a proper entrance, that technological upgrade that, that science has shown us works now needs to be applied correctly. And, you know, the other thing, you know, metaphor, if you will, that I talk a lot about with biosecurity is it's, it's kind of like an insurance policy. Nobody likes paying for insurance month to month that you don't use, but if you break a leg, if you get into a car accident, you're really glad that you have it. And so I think if it's maybe just semantics, it's putting biosecurity in that more positive light. So going back to that culture piece, it's talking about it. I've challenged many veterinarians, uh, when you go do your farm visit, Pick something that you can talk about biosecurity. Make it a part of the everyday conversation. Um, I've been trying to push for years. You know, we talk about the three things pigs need, feed, water, and air. I think they need biosecurity just as much as they need feed and water. Pigs don't want to be sick. Um, it's a welfare issue for pigs to not have feed. I think it's a welfare issue for pigs to be sick. And if biosecurity can prevent that, we can make that a part of the culture and a part of everyday conversation. It draws awareness and it draws attention and it gets people more motivated to put that into everyday practice. Tom, final word. Sure. I'd love to, this says, I'd like to springboard off a couple of those comments. Opportunity. It gives us practitioners the opportunity with new hires to, train because a lot of these people have not been raised on a farm they don't know what's normal and what's not normal for an animal or for a pig so it gives us the opportunity to say hey that's normal you know and he's he's just sleepy he, he doesn't have pneumonia you know and you can talk through those kind of things and then what that brings us to is the monitoring when it's abnormal that's when we need to hear about it and then we have to decide is this something we need to explore further or we wait and see for another occasion or another occurrence? So, yeah, I, I think that wraps it up pretty good with what we've talked about on biosecurity. I love it. Well, let's move into the Q&A portion again. Uh, okay. Audience, you're welcome to uh, submit your questions through the Q&A widget there on your screen and we'll get through as many of those as we can and any we don't get through why we'll follow up with you uh, someone from nia jenner one of our speakers will get back with as many of you as we can uh, after the event uh, but i want to thank dr andrea pitkin mr uh, Stu heller dr tom gillespie and dr nick wagner for being a fantastic panel let's go to questions <laughs> 